This is Adam and Eve. Well, not these guys. These guys. It's an engraving by German Renaissance artist Dürer in the early 16th century, currently housed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Dürer was fascinated by perspectives and human proportions, and this work was one of his experiments. I personally appreciate the strategically placed leaves, uh, as well as the hanging sign beneath the bird, which spells out Dürer's full name. Male and female, says the Bible, Adam and Eve were created, and while they may have been biologically true, the expression of masculinity and femininity is complex, and has fascinated philosophers and indeed psychologists throughout history. But first, it's very important to define some key terms, because they can mean different things in different contexts. So for our purposes, a person's sex is determined by the biological chromosome makeup, expressed through an individual's reproductive organs, genitals, and other physical characteristics. In typical circumstances, humans can either have two X chromosomes that make them female, or an X and a Y, which gives them male physical characteristics. Through sexual reproduction and genetics, males and females can continue to have more males and females. Of course, there are exceptions to the rule, such as individuals having multiple X chromosomes in addition to a Y chromosome. But of course, males can display typical feminine behavior and still remain male and females can display typical masculine behavior and remain female. So biological sex is not the end of the story. And so in addition to the term sex, we might also describe a person's gender as being the social cultural differences between being male and female. It's said to be a socially and culturally constructed idea of what male and female are that includes personality traits, social behaviors, and physical appearance. So while we might study sex in biology, here in social psychology, we're interested in gender, and in particular, the expectations that we all seem to have about gender roles. We actually live in a pretty unique time where we're given many opportunities to explore where these gender roles come from, what has been harmful, and what has been helpful. We'll be looking in particular at three theories of gender role formation as seen here. And let's start with the first one. So one explanation for the way that we develop our ideas of gender identity and roles is based on the assumption that it's strongly influenced by biological sex. Uh, one way of seeing this is from the viewpoint of evolutionary psychology. So when we say we're speaking from an evolutionary point of view, we're referring to concepts of natural selection and traits that will promote survival, or what we might call in biology, fitness. So based on our theories that humans used to live in hunter-gatherer societies, it makes sense that one sex evolved to be stronger, more aggressive and competitive, because that would enable them to hunt and protect the family better while the other sex uh, might have evolved to be more nurturing to raise children. Likewise, if humans were attracted to these traditionally masculine or feminine traits in the opposite sex, that would be a further evolutionary advantage for their offspring. It's a sound explanation why these traits evolved, although it doesn't quite explain why these gender roles are still formed and maintained today. Another idea is the theory of psychosexual differentiation, which relies heavily on hormones to explain gender differences. Indeed, when transgender men, that is, those born female at birth, undergo hormone replacement therapy, the added testosterone often increases male mental abilities, including an increase in visual spatial awareness and aggression. Of course, that's only half the story. Estrogen has also been associated with an increase in language ability. So it seems that the hormone that most influences the body during puberty could explain various gender traits. And finally, there's biosocial theory, which is strictly speaking, not a pure biological theory, but borrows aspects of socialization in its explanation. Money and Erhard observed intersex people, that is people born with both or ambiguous genitalia, uh, who have been given surgery to assign them to a certain sex. They suggested that the biological side, the genitalia, was what influenced how they socialized and therefore their perceived gender roles. However, it's not hard to see that this view ignores many other factors. New research suggests that gender has to be more than simply the genitalia one possesses. The biological approach does seem to explain why men and women display certain behavioral differences because of hormonal and chromosomal influences. However, it doesn't explain why some of these gender roles are still maintained today. In the next lesson, we'll look at the other two theories, cognitive and social learning.